It's our aim during this hour, you're hearing so many good messages on First Peter, and it's our aim during this hour to talk to you as a teacher, to give you some tools for as you go back uh, to be able to prepare to teach First Peter yourself. And so like, how about this coach we have who's going to help us teach the Bible? How about that? My guest today is John Piper. John Piper is the founder and teacher of DesiringGod.org. How, how many teachers are like me and when you get stuck on a passage, you go to DesiringGod.org to see what John Piper says? Yeah. He's currently the chancellor of Bethlehem College and Seminary. So for 30 years, he served as senior pastor at Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So, John, thank you for giving this time to all of us who are here in the room today, who are perhaps watching the live stream, and then we'll listen to this when it's on the Help Me Teach the Bible podcast. Thank, thank you. you. It's great to be here. Thank you. Well, there are lots of things we can pick up and teach. Uh, sometimes we look for a book that's popular that we think people will want to discuss and by that, you know, a, a topical kind of book. Um, and honestly, sometimes we think to ourselves, maybe more people will come and be more interested in what we're offering if it's some popular book that's been on the bestseller list or that everybody's talking about, rather than actually picking a book of the Bible that we will open up and teach, whether that's uh, at home or to the youth group or to the women's Bible study or a Sunday school class. So why should we be interested in equipping ourselves to open up a book of the Bible and then preparing ourselves to teach that book? Well, I don't have any categories in my brain for relating to people who don't think it's interesting when God talks. <laughs> um, so if they want to read a John Piper book <laughs> instead of the Bible, they're crazy. I mean, just <laughs> um, don't. So it, it, really, it really is, I think, a matter of uh, unbelief about all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for correction, for training in righteousness that the man or woman of God might be fully equipped for every good work. That's a lot of works. You want to be equipped for every good work at home, every good work at church, every good work in the neighborhood, every good work at work. Uh, read your Bible. Study your Bible. Know your Bible through and through. So it, it can't get more important than when God talks. And it's interesting when he talks. It's not just important and life-changing. God is endlessly insightful and fascinating. And we've just hardened ourselves with platitudes uh, against the amazing things that are here, which is, I think, what we're going to try to talk about. So you've made a case for why we would want to teach from the Bible. Help us with specifically, we're trying to figure out, am I going to do something from the Old Testament? Am I going to do a gospel? Why might we want to choose the book of First Peter to teach? Yeah. Well, because you might lose your job if you say you think so-called gay marriage doesn't exist, which is what I would say, or if you thought homosexual behavior, not orientation, might result in a person's destruction, you might lose your job, you might get a, a really bad slander. That's what First Peter's about. So it's relevant because the world we live in is increasingly like the world this was written to. Um, and I, I think it is perpetually relevant because the, the, the John Piper that I want to be is, is the John Piper of this book. 
I'm not there yet. When I, when I read the kind of person Peter is calling us to be in all these relationships, citizen relationships, work relationships, marriage relationships, church relationships, I look at myself in comparison to the ideal he holds up of this incredibly humble and tender-hearted and brotherly and returning good for evil and slow to anger. And I just shake my head and say, I need First Peter. I really need First Peter. So I taught it a year ago I, in the fall of 2015. I chose it. In what setting? Bethlehem Seminary. Okay. So 16 seminary guys and uh, in the Greek text. And, and I chose it just because all those things I just said, culturally and personally, it's a riveting book for me. So, so many of the epistles that we read come from the pen of Paul. And when we read them, we think about his history of being a Jew among Jew, but also have been, he's been a persecutor. And so we, we hear a bit of his personality in it. And we have First and Second Peter, these couple of epistles from Peter. So how does what we know about Peter, uh, from what we read about him in the Gospels, as well as what we read about him in Acts, which is a big transition there, certainly, how do we, as we begin to teach this book, uh, do we set the stage about who Peter is? Do we just let that arise in the text? Or what impact does that have? I'm thinking about our first week yeah. as we're introducing Peter and the first word of the book is Peter. Yeah. So how do we set the stage? That's we're a, hearing this from I, I like Peter. the way you, you asked that question. Okay. I thought you were going to make me answer it a certain way. Um, you can answer um, any question any way you want. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a real a bad example if it comes to stage setting secondary things. Um, so let me answer it with a qualified, uh, no, I don't spend a lot of time setting the stage by looking at other texts about Peter first. However, if your audience is like Peter who? <laughs> They don't have any idea that there's an apostle called Peter. That's a different audience than, than I usually teach. Um, and, and I would care that they not, be, they, they not be stuck on the name Peter. Like, who is he? And so at that point, probably, I would have uh, prepared a few texts from the Gospels, from Acts, a few little vignettes hmm. to just introduce people who don't have a clue who Peter is to who he is. What, what does the term apostle mean? And why, how did he relate to the others? How many were there? However, okay, having come your way and said yes to that, I don't know if you were going there. I don't do much of that. And, and I, here's the reason. Um, I really want this book to tell me who Peter is. And I really want this book to set the agenda about what Peter thinks it's important to know about Peter. I might bring from Acts or from Galatians chapter 2 a story about Peter that Peter would say, that's going to be misleading in this book. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, I'm preaching a sermon and somebody says, oh, you want to know about John Piper? And they dig back 20 years in my life and they find something I wrote in my journal about my wife and they, they, they put it out there, and everybody listens to that sermon through that grid. Like, not a good idea. Because I want to set the stage for that sermon. I, I want to tell people what I'm trying to get across. And so, I want to really let First Peter. And this, is, this should, be, you should feel to you like a relief, really. Because I think a lot of people come to the Bible thinking, God, got to know first century culture. I got to do all this historical oh, research before Cappadocia, I Cappadocia, Bithynia, Asia. My, what in the world? Where are they? Well, who cares? <laughs> be, be you know, in Asia, be in South America. I mean, really, let let the let First Peter tell you whether that's important. 
There will be clues, won't there? Here, if the setting of those Asia Minor provinces, Roman provinces, are they important? Well, let First Peter tell you whether they're important. Frankly, I think it would be a colossally boring first session to put up a map and work that over. I'll have to ruin everybody. You've probably done that. I've, no. I, <laughs> I've done it. <laughs> and, and I get done doing it and saying, they're going home with a little geography in their head, you know, and every, uh, marriage stays the same, kids stay the same, pride stays the same, everything stays the same because who cares where Cappadocia is? So um, all that to say, um, you, you can teach a very faithful and powerful series on First Peter without being an expert on first century geography or Roman culture or what, what was the persecution? Ah, uh, you know, you, commentaries write whole introductions talking about what was the persecution? I said, well, just read it. Just read it. See, see what Peter wants to tell you about, about the persecution. I, I think that's the most faithful and safe way because if you start bringing stuff in from outside, you might bring stuff in he doesn't want brought in. So as you taught through First Peter last year, like over how many sessions or weeks, what, what was the setup for you? I think you? it was 14, 14 two-hour sessions. So you broke this five-chapter book into 14 sessions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, I mean, that makes sense to me because it wonder is... wonder why they're laughing. I don't know. That, that sounds like a lot or a I, little? Uh, I, I think it makes sense once you're... Dying. I need a lot more. Yeah, don't we always... Right, have to keep figuring what we're going to cut out. Oftentimes, it's right. part of the job of a Bible yeah, teacher. Yeah. Right. And 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 you should ask me why that is. Why but, is that? You, we can get there later. <laughs> uh, I, I'll tell you why in a sentence, and you can tell me whether we want to talk about it now or later. Okay. Because I don't lecture. If I lectured, I could control totally how long this lasts. We get fitted in to the minute cover everything perfectly, that's not a good way to teach. Well, most of us, I guess, are used to hearing you teach that way. Yep. So you're saying that there are settings we're not privy to, yep. that that's not your preferred method. Absolutely. So that's what, what does it look like when you teach First Peter that it's not just a lecture? Okay. Um, walk into class, and I have given them in the previous class an assignment with maybe 12 verses, 10 verses, 8 verses, and they're to come having analyzed those verses with a method that... And do you have all obedient students because they don't want to disappoint John Piper? Mm, I don't think of it in terms of obedience, mm. but rather they, they love this word. They, they, they're there. Yeah. They're there they want to till up the ground in their hearts to be able to they, receive at I'm not time twisting teaching. anybody's arm yeah. to come to this class yeah. or to study this book. Yeah. They're, they're there because they want to be. So they're, they are, are analyzing this text in a certain way we call arcing, but that's, that's not necessary, but, but analysis. And then I, I give them study questions ahead of time. That is the hardest work. The hardest work for a teacher is good questions. And I think it's the key to teaching. Good questions is the key to understanding. Good questions is the key to teaching. And most teachers ask bad questions. Give me an example of a good question, a bad yeah, question. Yeah, a bad question would be, who are the people in this verse? Facts. What, yeah, what are the places in this verse? How many times does the word of occur in this verse or, or whatever? Just, just banal questions that you don't have to think at all. You want a question that is hard to answer. It makes you, where, why is he asking that? Where, how in the world am I going to answer that? Where would that be? So, I mean, you, you asked for an example. One of the hard, I wrote a whole article about this. Like in 3.9, um, it says, don't repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. But on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. So my question would be, is the phrase, that you may obtain a blessing, a motivation mm -hmm. for not returning evil for evil 
or is it the content of what they were called to, you, to this you were called, comma, that you may obtain a blessing? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a hard That's question. That's a hard question. And, yeah. and it, it I, not to overstate it, but a world hangs on that. Mm -hmm. A world of how Christians should be motivated. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, in preparing for teaching, uh, for what I do, is I spend on those eight verses probably four to eight hours thinking of questions. And the question... How many questions? End up with? Mm, ten, maybe. Okay. Uh, and, we, and this is why we, we needed more time. We never got through all the questions, okay. ever. That makes us feel better, doesn't it? We ever got through all the questions because once you get them going, and that's what you want your women to do, Get them thinking, get them talking, get them sharing their insights, get them correcting each other. Getting, you can't say that, it's not in the text, so you don't have to say that. Somebody else says that, because we're all wired to bring our experience to the text, say what it means to me, and you're trying to train these women, don't, don't do that. Get what it means to Peter, and here are reasons for why it means that, and, and the questions are all designed to push the nose down in the text and so that all the answers that you require have to come from the, the book. And as soon as they start talking and, and you're there um, shepherding that conversation to keep it from falling off a cliff on either mm -hmm. side, uh, then it will fill up the two hours. Yeah. Uh, in, in that setting with your group, um, sometimes we're in a Bible study d discussion like that and either there are two very strong opinions in the answer to whatever the question is. If we've asked a good question, that might be the case because sometimes maybe there's not just one answer. So like when you teach in that setting, are you, are you able to resist saying, well, here's the right answer? Yeah, that's a good Or question. do you want to? Um, if I know what I think the right answer is with really clear arguments, I do want to but I don't want to right away. Yes, that's probably the key, isn't if, it? Let us struggle a little bit on it. Or a lot. Or a lot. Um, and, and I want them, and, and this usually happens at this level of teaching, I think, I, I want to, I'm, I'm watching where they are on this, because they've got, they brought answers, and some of them are afraid to read their answers, especially if they heard a guy just give a really good answer different from theirs. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna pull them out what did you write? Read it to me. Because they have to bring written answers. Because mm -hmm. if you don't have them write them down, then they'll, they'll bail on you. you know, oh, I didn't have time. You had time. <laughs> Tell me what, what you wrote. And, and, and then they read it. And, and then two or three others had the same answer. And so now he's got three friends to gang up on this guy over here. And, and, and then they can start giving their reasons. And, and they will often wind up where I hoped they would wind up because of what I saw. But, but you if, have to be patient. I have you? to be patient, and, and I am a preacher. Uh -huh. I mean, I've been preaching for a long time, but I love doing this. I, I love not preaching in those settings. I, I love making them think, because I know preaching doesn't make the best preachers. Making people think makes the best preachers. If pre you know, these guys are going to go out... And uh, they're going to be sitting someday in a study on a Friday afternoon with a sermon coming on Sunday, and they've run out of all their textual notes from seminary, and they got to see or die. And if I haven't taught them how to see and think on their own, then they'll die. They'll, they'll quit. They'll, or they'll just start giving stories and silly anecdotes they get from who knows where. But they won't, they won't be thrilled by what they're, they're seeing. So my, my goal is train seers, seers. I think some of us might rather use our time to lecture because then it's very controlled. Yep. yep. And if yep. we're going to turn it into a discussion and there might be disagreement, that feels like a little bit like a high wire act and, or we're afraid a question or discussion is going to rise that brings up something we're just not equipped to lead in. Yes, which it always does, which is very good and humbling. I mean, if you, if you can't start off by saying, uh, guess what? I'm not God. 
don't, don't understand a lot of things in First Peter. I mean, I could take you to a couple of texts right now that I do not know what they mean. Oh. Just, well, let's go there. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. I'm, I'm no, just real that's... happy to start at the front end of finitude. You know, I'm just not God. And I just want you to know, you students to know, you're going to see things I have not seen. Mm-hmm. I'm very greedy to know what those are. Yeah. I want to be a learner. I want to be a student here. The best teacher I ever had was Dan Fuller at Fuller. And, and the reason he, 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 I think he would be okay with me if I say this in public, on film. The reason he was a good teacher is because he was a bumbler. He would walk into class and he'd put his notes all over the place. He'd say, uh, uh, would somebody ask me a question? I loved it. I just loved it. I was full of questions. And, and if you could just get him, you know, find the pump a little bit. <laughs> he just, out would come his ideas. And I just loved it. So he clearly was not intimidating. Mm. He, he made, I mean, he had two PhDs. And he made me feel like we could have a conversation. He, could act, he would open to what I had to say. I mean, you can't feel how empowering that is as a 20-year-old 20, 20 guy with a 45-year-old man with two PhDs who walks into a class and says, Would somebody ask me a question mm. <laughs> so, so we can get this discussion going? It was just mind-boggling what happened. In the, I took eight classes with him. Every time he opened the door, I walked into it just because his pedagogical Socratic style was was explosive for me. So to help us be better Bible teachers, would you say that we have to be willing to and actually have an increasing comfort with being willing to say, I don't know? (laughs) Absolutely. If you got to cover your rear end (laughs) by presenting some pretense of knowledge, you'd just be a lousy teacher. (laughs) just, that is not what teaching is about. It's about empowering, it's about releasing, it's about drawing out things they didn't even know was in them. And if you you present yourself as a know-it-all, you just shut them down. You just shut them down and they'll be impressed and they'll take their Mm -hmm. notes and they'll try to do the same thing in another place. What have you done? No way, that is just, that preaching is not that. See, I really do distinguish what my aims are for preaching and what my aims are in a seminary class with eight, 16 guys who are going to be preachers. This is very different. And so you have to decide, who are you talking to and what are your goals? What do you want to happen with these women? You want them to ape what you said uh, out there, or do you want them to become repositories of insight? Because when they open their Bible, they see things you never saw, which is what's happening in these guys all the time. I get into conversations with them later, and they'll say something. I say, whoa, <laughs> I never saw that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess we better dive into First Peter oh, a little bit, shall well, we? Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. So, well, let's. Uh, <laughs> we'll try not to get stuck too uh, anywhere too long, but I think we have to spend a little bit of time just in this greeting, and for you to give us a sense of what you would do with this greeting. We're not putting up a map. We know that. Uh, we're not. <laughs> we're not. We're not doing a long biography on Peter, but we do have this. When we look at it, we can't help but see. We see Father, Son, and Spirit. Well, that's that's sharp. You saw that. (laughs) You think that's obvious? Do I? That's not obvious. It's not. No. So what would you do with it? Oh, that's. I mean, it's absolutely glorious. That I mean, I knew that you'd see that, but but most people don't. I think they read this and they don't see. Oh, Trinitarian, Trinitarian introduction. They don't see that. It's amazing. It's amazing that it's there, I think. Mm-hmm. I mean, this early Trinitarian structures in the Bible, I thought that was fourth century, you know, got that figured out at Chalcedon or Nicaea. It's just incredible that, it, that it's here. I mean, the, the whole thing is, is unbelievably, <laughs> I don't want to say, stilted or complex or strangely structured. I, I think... Um, the first thing I would do is ask them what the word according to in verse 2 modifies. Mm. Okay. P- 
Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, according to, well, what, what's according to? And then you've got these th three phrases, according to the foreknowledge of God, in uh, the Father, mm -hmm. in the sanctification of the Spirit, for. for obedience to Jesus Christ, and then this really strange phrase, and the sprinkling of his blood. But so you got three prepositional phrases, all of them following that according to. So you got according to, and in, and for. What do those all modify? This is where, if, if you wanted to teach them sentence diagramming. Yeah, do you? Would you in your little it, group? It, it is assumed. Okay. So yeah. it's been taught before they get to me. And so I'm assuming they're doing either that in their head or on paper so that that kind of question, they, they just see it like, okay, line, subject, verb, you know, prepositional phrases. Where are you going to put those prepositions under? Where will uh -huh. according to and of and for, what will they come down from? Will it be elect? Uh -huh. Will it be exile? Will it be both together as a kind of unit? Not an easy question. Mm -hmm. But if you don't ask that kind of question, they're just kind of all hazy and whatever. So I know on Look at the Book, we, we see you work the text in that way. So in your situation with your seminary students, do you have a board yeah. where you are trying? Because I know sometimes when I try to diagram a passage, I, I, make, I might come up with several stabs and possibilities of it. I mean, is, is that a part of your teaching process that we're working together to see yes. where does the, do those things? Are yeah. these things parallel and what comes under what? Techno you got to... I mean, I don't know where your church is and you are technologically, but uh, the new iPad Pro, uh, you can actually write on. And so, um, and I, I'm using it now. So, or, or either, um, what, do they, what do they call it? You put a piece of paper under it, a little projector shows that piece of paper on the screen so you can write on the piece of paper. Or, once upon a time, they called them overheads. Yes. Transparencies, I did that for 30 years. So yes, in this setting, I will never do this in preaching. And I, I depart from about 10,000 preachers in that regard. But I don't do that sort of thing in preaching. Preaching to me is another kind of animal. It is a heralding moment. Thus saith the Lord, get on your face, hear the Lord Almighty. I, that is not my posture at all. We're just, we're, we're just groveling around in the text, scratching, trying to see everything. And a visual thing is really important to me. And visual, I mean, we all have different learning styles. I know for me, for a text, yeah, just seeing those kind of things on the page. It's not busy work. It's, it's organization that helps me understand right. what's the Holy Spirit intended emphasis. I've got to understand his train of thought, his, yep. the argument he's yep. building. Yep. And I, I'm going to get like at it. My brain works that way too. I, I typically, when I've got a text in front of me, I'll take a piece of paper like this. I'll fold it in half like this. Why I fold in half, don't know. Just do. Just like two sheets, because I always use a little, I have a rug on my desk because I don't like my hand on wood. It's cold. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and then since it's a rug, your pencil would go punch right through the paper. So you have to have this two sheets of paper. This is a bit of, of a tangent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just, Let's just come on back to First Peter. So I'm half sheets of paper and I'm drawing. I'm drawing uh -huh. and yes. I'm writing and I'm, because when an idea comes, like if you write exiles mm -hmm. and three questions come to your mind right away. Okay, these Jewish exiles, is this Christians being treated like exiles? Exiles from where to where? You, you write those down quick because you're going to forget them. You will. You'll forget them in the next five seconds. They'll go right out of your brain and you'll be on to something else. So you write those down and, and the pen, C.S. Lewis, I think, said this, like their eyes in a pen. There are eyes in a pen. You start writing down a question, the pen sees possible answers. It does. It, they happen in your head, but it's the pen being pushed across the paper, writing a question that causes the, the thought to come into your head. And it wouldn't, at least the way John Piper's brain works, it wouldn't come into my head if I was sitting here like this, trying to visualize or think three possible things. They're too jumbled. They're all jumbled in my head. And so I have to 
get them quick down on paper. And as I'm writing the questions about those relationships or those prepositional phrases or what elect means, what exiles means, as I'm writing them, possible answers come. And I quick write those down. And, and when I write those down, I see, oh, that relates to the thing down here in the bottom left-hand corner. So I draw a line down there. So after an hour, this is total chaos. This, this piece of paper is an absolute mess. And anybody would look at it and say, oh, that's garbage. They just throw it away. And to me, I do, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's, that's an hour's worth of insight. Don't touch it. That's, that's my, that will become a sermon or that will become. Mm -hmm. I guess I, I'm thinking I would do it a little bit different, but maybe this is um, a part of your. No right way. A part of your process too, that probably before I got to the blank page, I would print out the mm. text with really mm -hmm. big, yep. uh, you know, many, much space between them. Yep. Yep. And I'd be going through it, marking repeated words. I'd mark those, those prepositions according to, in the, for the, and I'd be more like writing on the margins. I'd, there's those three things. Those seem to be parallel. And I'd put a big, exiles, yeah. Maybe make a little note. Where else, where else do I see exiles? Yeah. So mine would probably be more working yeah. on a page that has the text written on it. Yeah, that's, yeah? that is absolutely not an either or for me. So, yeah. so that is either here or here or like you yeah. print out big. And I'm, I'm, but this little baby right here. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's right there all the time. Yeah. Because over here, um, triggers, something's going to be triggered. What do I do with that? Mm -hmm. Something is triggered. I, I see something, well, just one flash of insight of a relationship to Matthew 5, like so, something. And, and it, yes. is, it really can disappear in a yes. hurry. And, and so that, this little mm -hmm. capturer here. Well, if we were continuing to work through the first chapter of 1 Peter, and if we were using, let's say we were picking up a tool to use in the text of of repeated words. Mm -hmm. Then as we continued through 1 Peter 1, there's a number of words that really jump out repeated, but to me the most significant would have to be salvation. Uh, we have there in verse 9, uh, obtaining the outcome of your faith is salvation of your soul, concerning this salvation. And so that makes me uh, think that if I'm going to prepare to teach on this passage, that salvation, I mean, there are so many rich concepts in here. This born again to a living hope. Good grief. That's like one week, right? And the resurrection of the dead. But anyway, just help us with that when we get into this very rich uh, section. How are we going to determine what that what's going to be kind of the main place we're going with this text? That last sentence, how do we determine the main thing where we're going? I want the, the structure of these sentences to answer that question for me. I don't want to run through it quick, see a word like hope or see a word like born again or see a word like salvation. And because those are big, say, mm -hmm. main point. Okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. The interesting thing about the way the New Testament and really all of us write or talk is that uh, bigger realities can function as support for lesser realities, which are the main point. Main meaning logically supported by all the others. So I should have thought through an example here, but I'm thinking one in Paul. Uh, I am not ashamed of the gospel for the, for the gospel is the power of God and salvation. Now, what's the bigger reality there? Absence of shame for Paul or power of gospel? <laughs> no doubt. The power of the gospel is the bigger reality. And it's arguing for the lesser reality. Mm -hmm. So I have to teach, what do you, I need to teach them my, my language. You've all got language. My language is main point does not mean most important reality. Main point means what everything else supports in this paragraph. See the difference? What everything else is arguing for, supporting. That's, that may be, let's go eat. And the argument may be, I'm starving. Well, starvation is a bigger issue than lunch. Mm -hmm. But starvation is the argument for lunch. And, and so the Bible works. So if you say, now, how, how do you go about deciding what to do with verses 3 through 9, 
I'll, I'm going to tell them, follow the train of thought and show me what he is, he's arguing for. What, where's it all going? And, and we, we hear one of the biggest issues in First Peter is suffering. It's mm-hmm. almost everywhere. And when he gets to verse 6, mm-hmm. he says, in this. Now, that's that massive. Big question. What's this? Yeah, I think it's neuter. So it doesn't refer to any particular one of those feminine. Hope is, hope is feminine in, in the Greek. You know this. But it, it is amazing how well you can do without knowing Greek. That's the good news to me. It is very good news. <laughs> And, but it demands a lot of attention to detail because the English will be self-correcting. Like if you don't know that too tall, this in verse 6 is neuter and therefore does not have a direct correlation to inheritance, which is feminine, and hope, which is feminine. Therefore, it's not grammatically referring, but it's referring to the whole box of born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance which is incorruptible, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice. That, this, that big, glorious, newborn, mercy of God rooted, inheritance being kept. In this you rejoice, though you must suffer for a little while in order that your faith, more precious than gold, might be refined, refined and you will be found unto praise and glory and honor. There's the big end. There's the big end. Yes. And, and being born again is a means to that end. And having a promise of hope is a means to that end. And uh, the suffering you're going through as refining fire is a means to that end. And you're going to come out like gold at the other end. So I, and, and, that, and that feels like it's confirmed because that's where the book is going. The book is about suffering and how to be refined by it, respond graciously and humbly in it. And so I, I, w- I would say um, new birth is a servant in this text. It's, it's supporting other things. The promise of inheritance is a servant in this text. It's supporting other things. It's supporting the joy of verse 6. And the joy of verse 6 is sustaining you through the suffering. And that's being sustained by the promise that you're coming out like gold, refined, at the, at the other end, and that's the salvation that I think he's talking about here. So, so all of that to illustrate the answer to your question, when you look at a paragraph like this, and you want to lead these 12 women for two hours in discussing verses 3 through 9, what do you do? And, and the, the key thing besides the word studies, which is absolutely crucial, is the the logic. Yes. It's how the logic flows and what's being supported and what's arguing. Mm-hmm. When we get to chapter 2 of 1 Peter, we begin uh, well, I guess it's also in the second half of chapter 1. There are so many Old Testament mm. quotations mm, here. Mm, mm. Uh, there in verse chapter 1, verse 16, you shall be holy for I am holy. And then we've got this for all flesh is like grass where he goes to Isaiah. Then he's, when we get to chapter 2, these other quotations from Psalms and such. So when you are preparing to teach or help us as we teach this, certainly we just don't want to run over those things like they're just part of what Peter wrote, but neither do we want to get too stuck in teaching, uh, go back too much. So help us with how to handle uh, especially from this section of 1 Peter, Old Testament references. Yeah. Can, is that too general of a question? No, no. That, um, I, I, I've thought about it in 1 Peter a lot because there's some really odd ones. You know, the, the Noah the Noah piece is odd oh, in chapter 3. Oh, we're not there yet. That's I know, a hard but it, one. It's, an, it's an illustration of, of how I would ask the question about them. Uh, my, my first question is, why do you think he did an Old Testament allusion yes. here? Why, and here in, here in chapter 2 would be a good place to, to an, ask that. When, when, he, when he gets to, uh, well, there, there's that Old Testament allusion behind verse 3. You've tasted that the Lord is good. That's, mm, that's yeah. uh, uh, Psalm 34, 8, mm-hmm. uh, which, which is a big deal. That Psalm is a big deal for him because in chapter 3, um, verses what, um, 10 to 12, that's all from Psalm 34 
which makes you say, hmm, hmm. I think he liked Psalm 34. Hmm. Why did he like Psalm 34? If you see three or four quotes from Psalm 34, you might, one of your study questions might be, go back and read Psalm 34. What is it about this Psalm that made Peter think it was relevant so that he quoted it two or three times? That, I think that's a legitimate way to send them outside of First hmm. Peter, since Peter's clearly bringing that in. So I'm, I'm asking here why this reference to Isaiah 28 in verse 6 of chapter 2, behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone. And why a Psalm, what is it, Psalm 118, the stone which mm -hmm. the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Why did he go there? Why did he refer to Jesus as a rejected stone so that if you believe in him, you won't be ashamed? And I, that, I wouldn't answer that. I would say, you tell me, you know, what, so what would, is Would it? you take everybody to those references then and read mm -hmm, through those mm -hmm. passages? Yeah, I would, um. I would say, you, look, you've got a text in front of you and little footnotes there, you know, a little T, a little T beside it, and the T takes you down into the footnote, mm -hmm. tells you where it came from, mm -hmm. um, and then to go, go back and read it. But I'm, I'm asking them, what is it about, about the, the big picture of First Peter or chapter 2 that it even brings it to mind. Something brought to mind these two texts, Isaiah 28, Psalm 8, 118, uh, with regard to a stone that's a stumbling stone for some and a means of um, absence of shame for others and Jesus being rejected and, and see what they come up with. And you want my answer? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I think his mind gravitated there for the same reason it gravitated to Noah. Namely, they're in a setting where they are a very small, beleaguered, suffering, minority, feeling rejected. They are being maligned and rejected like a stone that is considered for a building project and thrown away. And he's reminding them, that's who your savior is. You, you think you're being singled out mm -hmm. for rejection? Mm -hmm. Your savior, according to the Old Testament, was a stone rejected and made the head of the corner. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what he told him in verse chapter one. You're gonna, you're gonna shine like the sun. Mm -hmm. R glory and praise and honor someday after you suffer mm -hmm. for a season. So I think he was gravit he was pulled that direction because he saw that. Same thing with Noah. Like, why would you go back and refer to preaching to eight, a few souls, that is, eight people? Why, why, would he, why did he say that? Why would he draw attention to the fact that only eight people got in the ark? Because you feel like only eight people in the Roman Empire. Or that may be what you feel like in your town. It's just eight of us, you know? And Peter's saying, they came safely through the water, and guess what? The whole world drowned. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He saved you. He will preserve you. It, yeah. Mm -hmm. When we, uh, there in the second half of chapter 2, we begin uh, with these numerous uh, situations in which mm. we're called to be in submission or right. subjection. And I mean, let's just be honest as teachers. When we get to this, we start to feel uncomfortable because we know no, nobody likes the idea of this. And so we feel this sense of tension and that we want to be faithful to God's word. We don't want to capitulate to our culture. Um, can you help us a little bit with that? Well, just in case they don't know what you're talking about, when he gets to, when he gets to 2.12, he tells us to keep your conduct good deeds, keep your conduct good among the Gentiles that they may glorify God. And immediately he's into submission. Submission to the governing authorities, slaves submission to masters, wives submission to husbands, husbands loving their wives. Likewise, he doesn't call husbands to submit, but he does use that interesting word likewise. We could talk about that. That would be one of my study questions. Like, uh. if, if, if there's not a reciprocity here with husbands submitting exactly the same way a wife submits, why, why the word likewise? But probably won't answer that now. Um, and, and, then, and then you get to 3, 8, finally, all of you. And the all of you there at 3, 8 yes. is sympathy, brotherly love, 
tender heart, humble mind, the very same mindset that, that caused citizens to go down and slaves to go down and wives to go down and husbands in their servant leadership to go down. This is a book that's calling us down, down, down in humility and servant like. So that, that's what you're asking about. And, and you're accurate to say this is not a popular mindset, nor has it ever been. Yeah, this is not necessarily among men or today, women, right? Nobody likes to submit to authority. That's where the world went off the rails at the beginning. <laughs> we hate to be told what to do, all of us, by God or anybody, policemen, you know, president of the United States, and what bathrooms we use or anything else. We don't like it. Get off my case. I'll be my own person. That's who we are by nature. And so this is very counterintuitive, countercultural, counter human nature. And to, to, to help, suppose you've got a lot of, you know, cool, relevant, Manhattan, sophisticated women in your, in your Bible study, and they're not liking this. I would, I would take verses 13, that's where you're starting, 13 to 17. And I, one of my study questions would be uh, to focus their attention on um, verse 16 and ask them, what does verse 16 say about the nature of submission to government? Because verse, and I'd probably just leave it like that, because mm. otherwise I'm going to tip them off what my answer is. What you is, want, what you're which going is for. What, It's really hard to ask questions without giving your answer away. Yeah. So verse 16 says, just after he says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, verse 13, whether to governors, whether to the emperor is supreme, uh, keep doing good. Verse 16, live as people who are free. <laughs> and you say, okay, what's the relationship between subject and free? Because they sound opposite, and they are opposite. If, if, if you are subjected to an authority, you, you're not free. Are you? Well, yes, you are. So you, that, this is why I stir up discussion. Like I say, come on, how are you free and how are you subject? Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants mm. of God. Okay, okay. Free, but slave of God. So who, who am I free in relation to? You're free in relationship to everybody. Child of God, daughter of God, son of God. You are a free man. Slave of the Lord. Pauline creeping in here, right, from 1 Corinthians. To be a slave of God is to be a free man. To be a slave of man, God's freedman. Paul knew all about this. Peter had it down as well. When we are born again, brought into the family of God, brought under God's perfect authority, we are nobody's slave. Not a husband, not a parent, not a government. We're free. Then, in that freedom, we are sent as freemen, free women, into structures, employment structures, where you punch the clock in, the boss says so, you don't, you get fired. Go in there, submit. Keep the speed limit. Pay your taxes. Why? Jesus said, do the children pay the taxes if their father is the king? No. But pay the taxes anyway. That's what he said. The, the structure is you're all free because your, your father is the owner of the universe. He owns the plantation. You're not a slave. So go work hard for the massa. <laughs> That's really controversial, right? That's really controversial. And, and that, I mean, we skipped ahead to the servants. Mm -hmm. Nice, That's the nice easy translation, servants, right? Day. It's yeah. slaves. Yeah. It's slaves. Slaves be subject to your masters, etc. And you've got the same dynamic there of with a conscience towards God, 
What is beautiful is if, if, if you're looking to God as your authority and you're submitting yourself as a free person to this boss, this master, this policeman. But um, the reason I said John Piper needs First Peter is because I'm, I'm as rebellious as anybody. I do not like you or my wife or my pastor or anybody telling me what to do. Now, that's got to be broken. Hmm. This book is about breaking the back of John Piper's rebellion until I am that beautiful verse 8. Finally, all of you have sympathy of mind, brotherly love, a tender heart, a humble mind. Those are the things that make you able not to repay evil for evil. I mean, think of it. Steph Curry last night lost it, right? He threw his mouthpiece at the ref. He lost it. Mm. He's sorry he lost it. Mm. Mm. I, I would have too. <laughs> Five bad calls. <laughs> he, he, he lost it. And this book is about don't lose it. Mm -hmm. If you lose it, 20 million people aren't impressed with your Christianity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, over and over again in this passage, he keeps giving us a why you're going to be subject. And so often, like for example, verse uh, 15, put to silence the ignorance of foolish people and numerous times. But I tell you what, let's go on to a couple because we want to, we're trying to help people who are teaching through First Peter, and there are a couple passages here that are hard. So uh, will you help us? <laughs> no. For us as we are, are, are teaching, especially for us as women when we're teaching women, when we get to chapter 3... Um, oh, I thought you were going to go to a hard passage. Oh, <laughs> well, that's next. That's next. Like, but for, here's the did easy. Did he go to hell to preach? Oh, well, we're going to get there. All right. Yes. But, Six uh, minutes. Help us here. Yeah. So uh, we, we discover here in, under this part of uh, wives submitting to their husbands, um, it says, for this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And if you are her children, if you do good, you do not fear anything that is frightening. And I guess sometimes when I think of Sarah, I don't think of her being as particularly submissive. I guess she did when Abraham said, okay, go pretend like you're my sister, right? Um, and so, how do we help people understand this passage rightly? What, what is he pointing to when he says, Sarah obeyed at Abraham, calling him Lord? Yeah. Before I say a word about the word obey there, which is really interesting, I, this, these six verses are, in my mind, the best place to go for helping women and husbands know what submission is not. Okay. And I've, I've preached on this maybe twice, two or three times. And in each case, I spotted like six things submission is not. And when you, and, and I, if I were teaching this class, especially to women, I would say, I want you to go home. And I want you to bring me a list from the text, mm. from the text, just write down things that necessarily submission is not from this text and it's amazing so they're, they're trying to win their husband which means they think he's wrong dead wrong so the first thing submission doesn't mean is agree with your husband okay that's a relief we're stupid husbands many times think things that are wrong dumb unhelpful, turn right, no, it's left, turn right, it was left. <laughs> so it doesn't mean agree. Second, she's trying to win him, which means she's trying to change him <laughs> on the biggest issue in the world. So submission doesn't mean stop trying to change your husband. I mean, those are huge. Mm -hmm. They are huge. When you read what Peter is, is saying here about what these wives are 
supposed to be doing with regard to their husbands. They want to, to win him. With regard to the, the braiding of hair, the, the uh, putting on gold jewelry and clothing, if you say, why is that here? Why did he go there? If the issue is trying to win a husband who's not a believer uh, by your pure and chaste conduct in, in fear, and I think the fear is of God, um, my answer is because in many cultures, including our own, she might think if I could just be pretty enough, impressive enough, cool enough, sharp enough, hip enough, whatever, I could get him to like me or be, and the want to be with we're teaching, me. There are women that we are teaching to who think that. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and so Peter's saying, don't, don't go there. It's, it's not going to work. It, you might get him <laughs> to like you more. And it would do zero good for his soul because he's impressed with all the wrong things. He's impressed with your hair or your jewelry or your, or your clothing. So I think that's probably why he, he kind of want to, mm-hmm. don't, don't think that's the solution mm-hmm. to your husband's distance from your faith, but rather go towards this inner beauty. And then those two words, gentle and quiet spirit, or if you want to, you know, the, the word quiet might, might sound like she can't ever talk. And it does say win him without a word. But clearly, she needs to articulate her faith. Otherwise, he didn't even know what's going on here. So I, don't, I think quiet would be more like tranquil. Mm. This woman is being called to something I want more than she does, probably. And I say that just to, for you to think this is a uniquely feminine, desirable condition of the soul. Not if you read 3.8, where it says, everybody be humble, tenderhearted, humble-minded. I want to be... Um, gentle and tranquil in my spirit. I don't want to be anxious. I don't want to be an anxious husband or an or a, a unkind, harsh husband. So that's the beautiful thing he's, he's calling for. And it's beautiful for men and women. And it has a peculiar beauty, I think, in a marriage relationship for a woman. Now, to, to your point, okay, Submitting to their own husbands, verse 5, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Now, here's where I think I would say, go go find that. Mm -hmm. Go find that in Genesis. Where did she do that? And I might ask, as part of this question, why didn't he use, 25 seconds, why didn't he use the illustration in Egypt where he told her, tell him you're my sister because I don't want to be killed? Mm-hmm. At least she could say, excuse me? <gasps> He's going to take me into his harem. Mm-hmm. I don't know what he said when she said that, mm-hmm. but this was not his shining hour. Mm-hmm. And he didn't use that as an example of submission. Mm-hmm. He didn't. He, I mean, that's the golden moment. I mean, you want a submissive wife, wow, there she is. There isn't any place she calls him Lord, except chapter 18, I think it is, where in passing... She is talking to God and calls him my Lord. Mm -hmm. It's like sir. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As though, and I think Schreiner takes this position in his commentary, it's as though he chose a throwaway statement where she's in default mode showing what's really in her heart in respectful talk, my Lord. And and that's the scene where she overhears the angel saying she's going to have a child, right? Right. Well, my Lord. Right, Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you ask, now, Peter, why did you go there to get that? I think he was saying, this is not mainly about picking the hardest situation you can think of where a husband might ask you to do something that would be dangerous or stupid or folly or sinful. This is about a wife's fundamental, basic, what are the gears doing in the brain when they're in neutral? Not when she's in control, putting it in drive or or reverse, but rather, are they they coming out with respectful Mm -hmm. language? Mm -hmm. That's what every husband wants. Husbands, I I think in general, unless they're sick, and there are sick husbands, aren't after wives who are compliant in the sense that 
everything I say you do like a slave. That's just not what marriage is and not what husbands are hungry for. Husbands do love it when their wives spontaneously say things that are upbuilding, mm -hmm. that are commendatory and respectful. And, and, uh, and, and, and it's so interesting that that's, that's the illustration that he uses for obey. Mm -hmm. Obey in the sense that you know what a man longs for. You know what makes this marriage work. Comply with that bigger, spontaneous picture. And the thing that makes this most preachable for a man, I think, or teachable for a woman, is this last phrase where you are Sarah's children. Mm, mm. If you do two things, the do good is part of a theme in First Peter. Six times we're called to do good, do good, do good. So this woman is full of good deeds and fearless. Wow. She's fearless. So if you, if you want to win an unbelieving husband to Jesus, that's the, that's the clincher. That's the clincher. He, he, he's not going to be impressed with makeup and hair and figure. And he's just not. But if you are humble on the one hand, talking him up and free from anxieties that he's all fretting about, He's not going to figure you out. Like, why aren't you worried about the finances? Why aren't you worried about the kids? And why aren't you worried? Don't be a worry wart. You want to win your husband, Jesus? Be fearless and absolute fearless. And this, this book is how to be yeah. free from fear. Don't sense. be anxious for anything. That makes me think back to the very beginning. You're born again to a living hope because you have an inheritance. That's, those are the kind of things that allow us to be fearless. Exactly because yeah. we know that we're not expecting so much out of this life. Well, it seems really wrong not to be spending some time on the spirits in prison and Noah and the ark and <laughs> baptism. So uh, and we, we simply don't have time for it, but are there maybe some res because like I've read a number of things on this and sometimes yeah. they differ. So maybe the best thing you do is give us some, re are there some things you have read about this or some resources for us to go to as we try to wrestle to through how we're going, and we're talking about the portion, uh, chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. Yeah. So maybe yeah. just point us to a resource or two. Yeah, and the same any? thing about preaching to the dead in 4-6. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Those two passages, those are the two passages I was referring to when I said I don't know what they mean. Oh, you don't? No. Um, <laughs> uh, I, 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 would, I have two, two interpretations in my mind okay. that vie for... Um, uh, upper hand, yeah. and uh, I mean, the two commentaries I would recommend yes. for, for, for them is uh, Grudem and, and Schreiner, probably Tom Schreiner's commentary and, and Grudem's. They're both, I think, manageable if you don't have Greek, mm -hmm. which I assume some do, but most don't perhaps. So that's where I would go. In, in, in regard to this particular issue, I, I don't think I'd recommend any particular article or anything, but I, I would just say... Um, Try to stand back from the details of really puzzling text okay. and, and try to just ask the bigger picture. Okay, not sure what he's saying here. <laughs> like, did, did he preach to the dead or did he preach in the day of Noah by the Holy Spirit to those who are now dead? dead. Mm -hmm. those, are the two, those are the two views, right? I lean this way, but I go back and forth okay. because I depends on who I read because <laughs> there, there are pretty good arguments both ways. I, I lean towards, I think Jesus in the spirit went and preached to the saints in the days of Noah, because that's what chapter one, verse that's 12 says. Say. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, and it makes sense for uh, why it would belong in first Peter. I'm not sure why he would even bother with it. If he was saying between the, the death of Jesus and the resurrection, he went to Hades and preached and liberated the souls. Uh, but what, I'm just, just not sure why that would mm -hmm. help in the text. But, but I'm not going to be dogmatic about that. If, if people come with real strong views about, yeah, but he descended into Hades, Apostles' Creed, that's where they get it. I think, mm -hmm. okay, uh, but that might not be what it means. Well, we're, we are looking forward here at the conference to hearing you preach through 1 Peter 5 tonight. And when we post tomorrow. this tomorrow, and when we post this episode on the podcast, we'll link to that so we can hear some things you have to say about 1 Peter 5. But when 1 Peter 5 comes to an end, the way Peter ends is 
he says in chapter 5, verse 12, I've written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. And so could we just close, John, if you would speak to us as we are people who really, um, we want when we teach the Bible that those we hear, hear the true grace of God. Uh, but there's a lot of hard words in here. Uh, would you... Uh, help us to know what's it going to look like for us to declare the true grace of God and to stand firm in it as teachers of the Bible. I, I would, if I hadn't done it already, make one of my assignments or study questions to be find all the uses of the word grace. Mm -hmm. And I really would encourage my women, all of them, to have a Bible software program on their computer, something simple or big, Logos is big, Bible works is big, Accordance is big, and then there, there are others, but I think everybody today should probably be working, because it makes word study so easy, mm -hmm. just click on grace, bang, there are your three or four occurrences, you read them all in context, bring back, what do you think true grace is, what's he talking about, stand in the, this is the true grace of God, because he began, he began that way when he said, concerning this salvation, the prophet prophesied about the grace mm -hmm. that was to come to you. And in chapter 2, uh, it is a grace when you are beaten for it and don't strike back. It's a beautiful grace. So the gr grace is a really big future-oriented with present implications term. So I'd go there, get them to read all those texts, and then I, I, would, I would take that stand firm in it and say just what in First Peter are illustrations of standing firm in it and, and the most the closest one is the devil roaring around and resist him firm in your faith. Is that my phone? I can't believe that. <laughs> my wife is calling me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so the devil is roaring around like a roaring, I mean, he's going around like a roaring lion and we are to stand against him in faith. So I think the standing here is Believe the promises you've seen. Believe the future that he's held out to you. Believe that he cares for you. Chapter 5, verse 7. It's, it's believing these glorious things that creates the, the firmness of the standing. And that creates the fearlessness of the wife in the marriage with the unbelieving husband that makes the husband say, I can't figure you out. That's something we want to be teaching as we teach First Peter, but it's something we need to as teachers. Yep. Right to, We need the true grace of God to impact us deeply, to become a part of us so that it becomes a part of our words. And yep. Yep. We, we want to be teachers who stand firm in the grace of God. Right, right? yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's a tension. Those two words are in tension, aren't they? Because standing firm, firm sounds... Not very flexible. Oak, oak, no, no. you know, not little teeny petals of a rose, but oak of righteousness standing, whereas grace sounds, mm -hmm. the people that are hurting you, right. you're not returning evil for evil. Mm -hmm. you're, you're blessing them. That's grace. Mm -hmm. So we, we've been treated that way. We stand like a rock in it. I'm accepted. I'm loved because he treated me better than I, I deserve. And now this maligning is coming against me. Will I be gracious? Will the grace, will the grace go out? Thank you, Dr. Piper, for helping us teach the Bible. You've been listening to Help Me Teach the Bible with Nancy Guthrie, a production of the Gospel Coalition sponsored by Crossway. Crossway is a not-for-profit publisher of the ESV Bible, Christian books and tracts, including Dr. Piper's newest book, A Peculiar Glory, How the Christian Scriptures Reveal Their Complete truthfulness. And if you're teaching through 1 Peter, you may also want to look at Crossway's um, Preaching the Word commentary series, specifically David Helm's excellent volume on 1 and 2 Peter and Jude. Learn more about Crossway's gospel-centered resources at crossway.org.